and it's my pleasure to introduce my student Dong Yuan Song, who is a fourth year PhD student in the bioinformatics program. So Dong Yuan has been very productive in method development for single cell data. And today he will present our new work called Cluster DE, which aims to address the so-called double dipping issue, issue in single cell data analysis. That means you analyze the same data for more than once. So welcome Dong Yuan and please start your talk. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. My name is Dong Yuan, and uh, today my topic is about our uh, new method, Cluster DE, which is a post-clustering DE gene detection method and robust to false positive inflation caused by the double dipping problem. So this is a collaborative work with um, my colleagues Ke Xin Li, Xin Zhou Ge. And uh, I will go through the introduction quickly. So the first question is, uh, what is the double dipping problem in single cell analysis? So when we are talking about double dipping, we mean that the same data is used twice. This is a very common case in single cell analysis because usually we don't know the cell identity um, in most cases cell types. So therefore we use another approach to do these things. First, we define the cell clusters by clustering on all the genes together. And second, we test each genes between cluster difference. Uh, so we call this differentially expressed for cell type markers. So you can see here we have the problem. Imagine that if one gene is associated with your clustering, then it will always be the DE gene in your analysis. Therefore, you can introduce some false positive DE genes even when the cell clusters are superior or not reliable. So here I use a very, very naive toy example to show uh, what I mean here. So the first figure is a density plot of the two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. So you can see this is from one uh, two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, just one Gaussian distribution, yeah. And if you check this on the uh, scatter plot, you can see that it shows some pattern because the uh, two dimensions are correlated with each other and they have different variants, but they come from uh, one joint distribution. And if you use the clustering algorithm, here I use the k-means clustering algorithm, you can divide it into two clusters. And if you do the statistical test here to test if the means of the two clusters are equal, on either first dimension, which is gene one here, or the second dimension, which is gene two, you will always get, get the um, very small p-values. So therefore, you can see, even with the simplest multivariate Gaussian distribution, if you just apply a clustering algorithm on it and do the DE after that, you will always get a lot of uh, DE genes. So there are some existing solutions to the double dipping problem. The first so, uh, algorithm is called the TN test, uh, but the key idea is that they try to split the data as training data and test the data. Then you do the clustering on the training data and uh, transfer the labels to the test data and do the DE on the test data. The second method is called the uh, account split. Uh, and uh, in this method, they treat each count of your single cell data. So imagine that um, you have n, n, sorry, n cells and p genes, then there are n times p counts in total. And what they do is that they, that they, is that they use the binomial sampling to split each count into two parts. And they think that this is uh, independent uh, train test splits. And they do the clustering on one part and do the D analysis on the other part. Uh, there are also other cell split methods and the gene split methods which were discussed in this paper, but none of them works when genes are correlated with each other. So some of the methods, they may work if genes are not correlated with each other or genes are independent, but we know that genes are always correlated in our real data analysis. So therefore, although they may have some very nice statistical properties, but in reality, they just fail for dealing with this problem. So therefore, we propose our own solution, cluster DE. Uh, let me introduce the illustration of our method. So here, the red box shows you the double dipping 
problem. We have two possible cases. In the first case, the real data only contains one cell type and you use any type of clustering algorithm to divide it into two clusters. So therefore you know that the two clusters are definitely, uh, that definitely unreliable. In the second case, you have real data set with two cell types. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is okay if you know the two cell types. So unfortunately you don't know that. So therefore you perform the clustering algorithm. And unfortunately your clustering algorithm does not equal to your true cell type, but it also reflects some kind of variation of your data. So for both of the cases, you will get uh, anti-conservative p-values, which means that your p-value is actually smaller than what you want. And if you just perform the standard multiple testing correction, you will get a lot of false discoveries. So how should we deal with this problem? Our solution is actually quite simple. So we have two algorithms. The first algorithm developed by our, developed by our group is called SCDS3. So use this algorithm we can generate a synthetic null data. So this null data will resemble your real data, but it comes from one homogeneous group. Uh, and it also keeps all the mean expression levels of your each marginal genes and also the gene gene correlation structures. And therefore, if you perform a clustering algorithm on it, it will show similar clustering uh, results as your original data. And you perform the DE analysis you get the new p-value for your synthetic null data. And after that, we con construct a contrast score, which is just the log differences between your real data p-value and a synthetic null data p-value. So therefore you can imagine that if your real data is already a null data and your synthetic null data can resemble your real data quite well, then this contrast score will actually be centered around zero because uh, each p-value will be similar to each other and the difference between them will just be a uh, random. And therefore use this approach, we can recalculate the correct cutoff and get the correct FDR control. So if you are interested in our related two works, SCDN3 and uh, Clipper, you can read our paper. The first one is still on bioarchive, but we hope that it will come out uh, in Nature Biotechnology soon. And the second one was published on Genome Biology uh, two years ago. Yeah. The previous introduction is just a graph, uh, graph introduction. So here I use uh, math, math, mathematical notations um, to formally define the results. So first we denote yig as a measurement of feature g in cell i. So this is just a one count of your of one gene in one cell. And uh, we have m genes and uh, n cells, but usually m can be larger than n, especially if you are dealing with a real cell type. And the yi, which is yi1 from to yim, is one cell's gene expression vector. So this is one observation in your data set or one data point. And zi belongs to zero or one is each cell's latent unobserved cell type membership. So in our study to simplify our um, discussion, we only consider the existence of two, at most two cell types. So we first assume that p zi equals to zero uh, is alpha. So we said alpha is just not smaller than 0.05. So therefore, um, zero always represents a larger cell type. Why we need to introduce the alpha here is that we uh, want to incorporate the case that we only have one cell type. So you can see that if alpha equals to zero, it means that we only have one cell type, which is ZI always equals to zero. And here we have the data set as Y1 to Yn, so there are N cells, and the ZI hat represents the clustering result. So the clustering algorithm is applied on the whole KY. 
So which means that you use all the cells to get the clusters of each individual cell. But it also belongs to zero and one. So therefore, uh, we can, if you think your clustering algorithm is uh, trustworthy, then the ZI hat should be a good uh, approximation of the ZI. So here we want to formal, uh, formally define the hypothesis setting and the naive DE method. So for each G and J, if Z is known, then you can see here we only want to compare two means, mu zero J and mu one J for this G and J. So this is just the mean differences between the two cell types and the true now hypothesis is mu zero J equals to mu one J. Um, if you are very rigorous and you want to consider the case of only one cell type exists, for example, they always equals to zero, then we can uh, get a slightly modified version of the null hypothesis, which is one minus alpha times the mu j minus uh, mu one j equals zero. But unfortunately, in reality, we don't know the the true cell type Z. So we, if we only know Z hat, what people did is actually they define such kind of uh, DE test. So mu zero J double DP is the uh, expectation of YJ given that Z hat equals to zero. And uh, one J, mu one J double DP is when the expectation of uh, Z hat equals to one. So therefore, you can see that um, these two hypotheses are actually different here. And you can imagine, even though we reject the H0J double DP, we can still have the H0J holes in our uh, real data analysis. So that's the reason we want to solve uh, in our algorithm. And uh, the second thing is very important. Uh, we want to def uh, give a definition of the distribution of one homogeneous cell type. So this is imagine that all your cells, they come from one single cell type. What should they look like? So we assume that all the cells are sampled from one M-dimensional distribution, we denote it as F0. Um, given the literature, uh, we usually assume that uh, the genes follow the negative binomial distribution in single cell data analysis. So therefore, we assume that F0 is a multivariate negative binomial distribution. But the problem is that, um, not like multivariate Gaussian, the definition is quite clear and you can write out the density in a closed form. For the multivariate negative binomial, the closed form can be very tricky. So therefore, due to the complexity of this, we hope that the Gaussian copula method can approximate the multivariate negative binomial distribution. So what do we mean the Gaussian copula here? Uh, here, the Gaussian copula is a way to construct a joint distribution by modeling all the marginal distribution and using a multivariate Gaussian distribution to link the marginal distribution together. So specifically here, each mu ij, so this is the uh, i cells counting gen j follows a negative binomial distribution. And for the joint distribution, we assume that we can use the uh, multivariate standard normal distribution to link all the marginal CDF into a uni, uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. In other words, we think that the uh, um, quantiles of each marginal distribution has some kind of correlation and be described by a multivariate Gaussian. So here we have the mu zero as the mean parameter of each marginal distribution and zero as the dispersion of each marginal distribution and R0 quantifies the correlation of all the marginal distributions together. So 
So the cluster uh, DE algorithm is then come becoming quite intuitive. The idea is just to try to construct an city connective control data. Tell why now, which is derived from our SDN3. So specific speaking, what we did here is that we sample the why I know from a multivariate negative binomial distribution with mu hat zero, sigma hat zero, and the r hat zero, which are all estimated from your real data. So in other words, here your synthetic null data, the mean and the variance and the correlation, they are all similar to your real data. But the only difference is that this synthetic null data comes from one homogeneous negative, multivariate negative binomial distribution. So the intuition of this method is that we try to construct the most similar homogeneous cell type to the real data. Uh, of course, this is an open question. So if you have like better approach to do this, uh, we would definitely happy to try. Uh, and there are also other literatures about this question. Uh, in our practice, we find out that uh, our approach works pretty well. So we will uh, continue to use this approach to construct a synthetic now. Then we perform the clustering, same clustering algorithm on your real data and null data simultaneously. So therefore you get the clustering label the I had and the I now had simultaneously. And you calculate the p-values given the ZI hat and the ZI now hat on your real data and the synthetic data. So this is uh, what we have in here. So this is uh, p-values from your real data and this is the p-values from your synthetic null data. So remember, you need to use the same pre-processing approach and the same uh, clustering algorithm. So this is uh, very important because you use different algorithms, you, can, you cannot actually um, make sure that those data set will perform similarly. And uh, therefore you can make sure our contrast score is uh, centered around zero. And we then contrast, construct the diff contrast score. Uh, actually, this is not that important. Uh, if you can use other uh, type of choice, uh, for your gene DE score, you can also try this. But in our analysis, we found out that the p-value actually uh, is very is actually very convenient because everyone uses it. So here we you define the contrast score as uh, um, differences between the log p-value from your synthetic null data and your real data. And we use the Clipper algorithm developed by uh, Dr. Xinzhou Ge to find the correct cutoff for your FDR control. So this is just based on the uh, symmetry uh, assumption for your contrast score. So if uh, your real data and the null data, uh, they are actually both from the null cases, then this contrast score should be uh, symmetric uh, around zero. And therefore you actually count the, uh, proportion smaller than your cutoff and the proportion larger than your cutoff. And to make sure that this is smaller, not, um, not larger than the um, than your desired uh, FDR control level Q. And the outputs will be all the genes with contrast score larger than this cutoff. Yeah, so that's all the method part. Uh, if you have any questions, you may stop me here and uh, uh, the next part will be the result. Okay, cool, uh, I will continue. So in our simulation analysis, we first performed a simulation analysis on a uh, complete null data, which is which means that there's only one single cell type. And uh, we benchmark our approach to the naive approach, which is just the default DE in SURAT and the count split and also the TN test. So you may notice that here we have multiple different statistical tests. So those are the commonly used tests in SURAT package because 
our method and can split uh, both um, flexible to different statistical methods. So therefore, we can check the performance uh, of our approach on different statistical methods here. And here we, we can see that first an IU method completely fail in controlling the false discovery. So you can see that the false discovery is, is just zero. Uh, sorry, it's just one. And uh, count split uh, did a slightly better work than naive and uh, TN test is also uh, very, very slightly better than the naive method, but they all fail in controlling the false discovery. So you can see that even in the smallest uh, case, the false discovery rate can be uh, over 40%. And come back to our class B algorithm, you can see that we control the false discovery rate for at least three of the uh, out of the five different tasks. And even for the other tasks, we cannot fully control the false discovery rate. Uh, it is also much better than all the other methods. In the second result of the simulation study, we uh, use uh, accuracy of classroom result to represent the degree of double dipping. So re recall that if your uh, clustering result is uh, more different uh, than your two labels, then it means that you actually have the double dipping problem more severe. Uh, in contrast, if you have the 100% correct uh, Answering algorithm, then you don't have the double dipping problem here because your inferred um, cell type is actually just a true cell type. And here we can see that very clearly our method can always control the false discovery rate, uh, given that the test is a real coxon test. And as we expected, um, if the double dipping problem is more severe, the, the other methods just, uh, perf uh, just uh, perform worse than the more accurate classroom results. So you can see here, if the, your classroom is very inaccurate, then all the other methods, they show very high uh, false discovery rate. Uh, you may ask that uh, our method, do we still have power? If or it just like uh, our method is very conservative, so you never find any discovery. So using the um, power versus the uh, actual false discovery rate, we can show that our method uh, has very reasonable power. So the power line of our method is, uh, is close to the naive method, which is just uh, uh, default uh, B analysis. And we also perform the analysis on real data. So here we collect five different cell line data sets. And you can see on the UMAP space, they, they look pretty um, homogeneous and the cell type, uh, cell, type uh, cell clustering labels uh, represent nothing because they are pure cell lines. So there's no existence of any uh, different cell types within it. And uh, using this uh, <coughs> five data sets, we show that our methods just give you zero discoveries in most of the cases uh, with some exceptions because uh, the method uh, is not um, always controlled the false discovery rate on each individual data sets. But uh, in general, it controls the false discovery rate for most of the cases. Well, the other methods they just uh, failing in control of the false discovery. And the false discovery rate can be very high because actually here we only uh, keep about uh, seven to seven thousand uh, to eight thousand genes for the D analysis. And you can see if you just use a naive method, in the most conservative test, you still have around this. 2,000 to 3,000 DE genes. So remember, this is a cell line data. So you can think that this is very crazy number. You do this D analysis on cell line data, and eventually you got a few thousand DE genes. It shows that how severe the double dipping problem can be in our real data analysis. On the other hand, we want to show that our 
uh, discovery can still be useful for um, biologists. So here we show the UMAP for the analysis uh, of for different uh, for monocyte uh, real data sets. So here the in the first line in the first column the color represents the two different cell types, and in the second column the color represents the class result, and in the third column this is the synthetic null result and the class result. So we can show that compared to previous result on cell line data, now using the clustering DE, we have a lot of discoveries, although much smaller than the other method, but we have a reasonable number of discoveries from uh, 50 to around 50 to around 200. While the other methods, they still show a lot of discoveries. And we want to show that our discoveries are actually better than their discoveries. So how do we want to, uh, how can we show that? So we here we visualize the distribution and the density of the top 50 common DE genes identified by different statistical tests from cluster DE or the naive method. And here, this is the gene levels. And uh, you can see that for the top DE genes identified by cluster DE, the densities of the two cell types are quite different from each other. But if you check the densities from the naive method, although they actually show differences, but the shape and the shift of the mean are much minor compared to the cluster DE method. Cluster DE method. And if you check the UMAP uh, plot, you can also see that here for all the marker genes we found in cluster DE, they show a clear uh, bimodal pattern. But here for the naive method, although the, you can recognize those genes show some variation, but it seems like the variation is more like a continuous transient or gradient uh, in your UMAP space. So therefore we tend to believe that those D genes actually uh, are actually much more like to be uh, much more like the uh, marker genes we imagine for most biology analysis. And in the last analysis, we do the GSEA, so this is a gene set enrichment analysis for the two gene sets. The first gene set is a monocyte markers, and the second gene set is a housekeeping gene. So you can imagine if a DE method gives you very good results and the, for the markers of monocytes, then the monocyte markers should be much more enriched, and the housekeeping genes should not be that enriched. So here we can see the clustering D algorithm actually gives you the results. So the, all the, in all the statistical tests, the monocyte markers are enriched as a, bot, uh, as a top of the D list. Uh, in contrast, the housekeeping genes, they are either not enriched or enriched at the bottom of your D list. But if you do this on your naive data, uh, sorry, naive algorithm, uh, which is a default surat, you actually show that first the uh, monocyte markers are not as strongly enriched as in our cluster DE. Secondly, you actually observe all the housekeeping genes. They are also enriched in the top of your DE list. So therefore you can imagine it that if you just apply this naive method, you, your top DE genes might be dominant by those housekeeping genes. Uh, I guess that's usually people don't want to see in their um, real analysis. Okay, so that's all for my uh, talk today. And uh, I would like to appreciate my collaborator, uh, Xinjo Ge and uh, Ke Xin Li. And also thanks for Jessica's uh, advice and also other suggestions from the, uh, our lab. Thank you.